book um, is a combination of a series of threads that have come through for me in the last year or so, uh, as I've been thinking about the last 10 years where I've been working in open access. Um, so what I want to do is talk a little bit about who I am and why I've um, give, got, got the perspectives that I do. I want to look at some issues with open access and with um, and where it's going. Um, and I don't know, maybe we can have a discussion afterwards about how, to, how we might be able to mitigate and ameliorate some of the problems that have come up. So um, first things first, me, uh, there are some of the organizations that I've either worked for or consulted with over the years. Um, I worked for a long time for Demon Internet in the UK in the 90s. I've worked with technical startups. I've worked with um, Foo.com was a great startup. We spent 80 million pounds and never launched. It was all venture capital money. Uh, I've worked for G GCHQ. I've worked for the Conservative Party. Um, I've put the um, the uh, John McGuinness's uh, fantastic. Um, we sponsored his um, Isle of Man TT uh, bike. And I put that there because I seriously think that Vimto gave me diabetes. Anyway, um, so a lot of, uh, Macromedia, various other companies. And then the last few years, uh, the University of Otago, technically, and then I became a librarian and came to work at the University of Canterbury, which is where some of you might know me from. So the idea here is I I've worked in a lot of different places with a lot of different business models. I I've gravitated towards universities because they're more complex than corporate organizations. And um, and that provides me with um, the kind of um, interestingness that I need. But I think bringing some of those ideas from uh, startups and from uh, corporate organizations has, has really um, provided me well with a, a, a view to some uh, to um, to this particular problem. Uh, this is a really bad slide. Seems to have, have, have been jaxed itself. This is Russell. Uh, Russell Stanford is a, um, a chemist who, a, a process engineer, who works in uh, at a target at Canterbury. Um, he has a little bio there that tells us that um, he, you know, he's a Canterbury boy. He grew up here. He likes um, uh, doing things with hydrocarbons, and in particular, making hydrocarbons more accessible and 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 less harmful to the environment. Um, you know, doing the working the good fight. Uh, here's a paper of his um, that has done very well for itself. Actually, he's he's an early, very much an early career researcher, but already he has been um, doing very very well uh, with his rankings, and that's because of the uh, fantastic way that he has been um, uh, uh, collaborating internationally. In fact, he only collaborates internationally, uh, hasn't uh, written anything with any uh, Canterbury authors, and uh, has done, you know, has done quite well for himself. Um, this is his, um, uh, this is his Scopus profile, and you can see that he hasn't published that much yet. He's building up to it. Uh, 2024 was a big year for him, and that paper we had a look back before, he's getting quite a few citations. He is getting some traction uh, in his work, and um, he is one of um, he's one of those um, early career researchers that we would look to to support and to um, make sure that his his work was well um, uh, was um, well promulgated and had as much impact as possible. Now, PubP is an interesting thing. PubPeer is a post-publication peer review platform. And what it does is that people can tag a DOI and then write comments about those articles. It's, uh, it's very much across every here where it's got a DOI and it, it, it's, it's got a little browser plug in it. It's lovely. So when you look, go and look at a, um, go and look at a paper, uh, it will pop up and tell you that there's a comment on PubPeer about that DOI. And it might be that it's been protracted. It might be the problem. And, and I just typed in Canterbury into PubPeer to see what was going on. 
see, you know, what comments people were leaving about our scholars' um, work. And this one was an interesting one. It said, um, Russell J. Stanford provides an affiliation with the Department of Mechanical Engineering. There is no one of that name at the university. And you know what? It's true. He it doesn't exist. The photo I had before was AI. His, his, his Scopus profile is real. Everything else I showed you is real. The papers are real, but he doesn't exist. He's a totally made up uh, um, identity. All his papers have been pa published in Elsevier journals. He's doing quite well for himself. And, I and there's a discussion internally, only half joking, maybe we should keep him. Yeah? Okay, so what I wanted to present there was something that really started me thinking about um, how the, the, the links people will go to to be able to play this academic game. And that led me to the thought uh, that Cory Doctorow had come up with previously, which is about enshittification. We all understand this to a level. We all know when Facebook was a better place to be. We all remember Twitter and what happened to that. We all remember all of these lovely online platforms that started providing a service for us as customers and then slowly over time pivoted towards con just concentrating on profit to shareholders and how the service changes with that. You remember, I, I suspect most of us here are of an age when we remember hearing that, you know, if you're not paying for a service, then what you're doing is you're providing the content for them to sell or for them to mine. We know this is true. I've been following Corey from, for a long, long time, from since Boing Boing days uh, back in the 90s. And I find him one of the most perceptive and interesting commenters on internet technology and, and business um, um, it, it, that exists at the moment. So that's a really interesting example to think of. Okay, so we've got these platforms. We've created open access, which is for customers. We've created publishers. How does enchitification apply to that? And what I want to do is take two case models, the two different publishers who are both looking at open access as a way of improving their businesses. So let me move on to a few more statistics. All the statistics I'm going to be using out of here, or virtually all of them, come from Open Alex. So I've been using Open Alex to drag uh, statistics out of and very happy to provide the, um, the background to how I did that. So here is a, an interesting graph, and it's not the one that maybe we that I was actually expecting to see. This is the number of published articles in Open Alex done by year uh, since 2003. We can see COVID at the end has had a big effect, but we can see that the number of published articles actually hasn't been rising the same way that it had been up to 2015. I'm sure you remember um, discussions about Publish or Perish. Uh, I'm sure you remember discussions about um, there being too many articles for people to follow, too many journals publishing too many articles, and it was just becoming problematic. Well, we can see that, interestingly enough, um, there seems to have been a bit of a, uh, there seems to have been a drop off, and that surprised me a little bit. However, here of here are the in, in euros the amount of article processing charges that have been paid. So in this is a relatively simple query to make in Open Alex. To go, okay, if they everyone paid top whack for those articles, so it, it, it's not an accurate figure, but it's I think the I think the um I think that the uh, trend is obvious. And funnily enough, when you look around 2015, when they stopped publishing so many articles, 
publishers started making their monies in other ways. Rather than subscriptions, they pivoted to a per article basis of getting paid rather than a yearly subscription for a journal. And this is sensible. It's a smart thing to do. It's what we were asking them to do as librarians. We were asking them to pivot to open access. Here are the number of articles for two different publishers that charge APCs. One of them is uh, Elsevier, the other one, MDPI. Both of them have a different model. MDPI is purely gold, so that is um, uh, purely open access um, to every article in there an APC got paid for. The other one, there are articles that APCs were paid for, one way or another, either gold or hybrid, with an Elsevier. And you can see, very successful. This has been a very successful move. Again, from that movement of that moment about 2015, things be, be, beginning to build up. So not as many articles, but actually making the value from each article, being able to extract as much from, for each article as you possibly can. So I wanted to look at sustainability. Sustainability is a single title within MDPI. This is the number of articles that get published in sustainability uh, each year. And you can see that it, 2022 peaked probably around 1,700 articles in one journal in one year. Why would a hyper journal work? Well, it works because as we shift from the idea of a journal through to article as being the atomic level of, of understanding of how scholarly publishing works, it's more work to have more journals and more titles. It's just more effort. It's more efficient to shove as many articles through one title as you can. And how much difference does that make when all of our uh, search engines, when all of our discovery layers, when all those kind of bits and pieces um, are, are flowing through? Okay, here's sustainability. We think of it, we sometimes MDPI gets uh, a bit of a rap uh, in terms of um, quality. It's in the top. Um, second quartile, it is Simago. So this is this is um, yeah, someone else judging them, and it's in top. Um, it's in the top quartile for it, its main focus in Q1. So it's doing really well. Here's how much money sustainability made um, each year, and you can see 2022 at that price one. It, it giving it at uh, almost 3,000 uh, US APC an article, uh, it made about $50 million uh, in revenue for that year. Okay, so I'm, I'm belaboring a point. I get that I'm belaboring a point, but it's useful to put, I think, to put numbers to that. To me, this looks like an excellent business. This looks like an excellent way to make money. I'm getting things for free. Yeah. I'm charging people to publish it, to put it onto an online onto an online service. And you know, my revenue is very, very high. So what do I do to improve how I, I can keep as much money of that as I possibly can? And that's what a business is going to do. Once it's provided the service, it's got a toehold in the door, you're getting this many articles through, it's become a stalwart of, the, of your discipline. How is it I can do that? And the best way to do it is to reduce labor costs. A couple of days ago, one of the MDPI workers um, uh, in Romania fell down and died. Now, this is, again, it, it's a coincidence. However, what this did is it brought up a whole discussion about working at MDPI, what that's like. 
And if you go and have a look at the article that uh, is in there, you'll see a lot of discussion from people who have worked there who say that it's a difficult, toxic working, uh, working workplace, much like any other social media that have to put through volume. So if we think about um, people who are uh, working on YouTube, we think about people who are uh, moderating Facebook, if we think about, th this is the same model. And will provide the same problems. We are funding organizations that are not provide, uh, that, that are actively harming their workers. Nothing against the people at MDPI who are working there. Okay, so here's the argument that I'm making. Increased revenue, more articles. Okay, so um, we're looking at 200% more articles uh, in the top 10 publishers between 2013 and 2023. So the rise wasn't as large as it has been historically, but it's still rising. Lower costs. How do we lower costs? We pay people less. That's how you lower costs. And um, I come from this from a, this may sound very bald, but uh, I come to, from this from a, um, uh, an un, this is why I tried to point out, I, I worked for a lot of corporates in the past. I, I understand how this works. What does that lead to? It leads to a degradation in the service for the end customer and a focus towards the people who are um, uh, who for who own shares in these companies, which is, as Corey Doctorow describes, uh, the, this process of incentivization. Okay. To give a bit of a contrast to that, let's have a look at another model. This is taken from last year's um, archive. Um, but the guys from Archive came and visited us um, this year, and um, scientific director and, and some other people came and visited us, gave us some stickers, and um, and were absolutely fascinating. So they have um, uh, five million users, three point one billion downloads, two point four uh, million total submissions. That's how many submissions there are in Archive, right? So. Again, it's a platform providing pretty much what MDPI provide with the understanding that these are preprints and they're not going through peer review. And so that, that's not happening. However, they do that for about $5 million a year. That's all it costs. That's a shockingly low number. Sustainability, remember, was $50 million of revenue for a minute number of articles. Okay, so this is kind of where I want to wind this up because I, I think, I think my, my, my point is quite plain um, that what we have is a process where the two, two of the biggest publishers, and I've used those as case model, case studies, have um, decided that um, they are now going to focus on, um, I, I have to join one more thing up, um, but they have decided that they are going to, you know, improve, improve their service by improving their profits to shareholders. So I've been talking about MDPI a lot. The reason I mentioned Russell Stanford at the start, is that no one asked if Russell Stanford worked for Canterbury. People tell me the reason to publish in reputable journals is that they will then do the work of um, editing, peer reviewing, checking, and you know what, they don't. They used a Gmail account for Russell J. Stanford and used that to actually verify that he existed. Russell J. Stanford is part of a series of, um, th this, is, this has happened before, 
the last time uh, the people at Retraction Watch had seen uh, something like that happen was uh, a series of false identities that have been created out of Nanyang Technological University. And the mistake they did with that is the, the librarians at Nanyang Technological University, who I've, I've worked with um, uh, when I was doing library carpentry stuff, um, they're all over every article that comes out of that institution. They're grooming them, they are making sure they work, they're making sure that they get the best possible output. So when someone invents uh, a, a, um, uh, an identity within that, it gets spotted. It was pure luck that I was looking through something at my mid-tier, mid-ranked, mid-sized international university. Do we have time to go through and make sure that every article that is actually someone who works here? Well, actually we can, we can use authenticated ORCID IDs, but that's just a stopgap. My question is, why did the publisher let that through? And they let that through because they are doing less work for us to make sure that their profit margins are better, which is reasonable. It's not an unreasonable thing. Um, I, 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 I'm not saying that, that, that it's, it's necessarily a bad thing, but these are the, um, what I'm saying is that this is just a, a, a comment on the fact that this is what's happening we have a responsibility to ask if that's okay or not. And what I'd like to do is put this out to, um, um, what I'd like to is put this out to everyone here. And uh, I see some questions have come up, uh, which we can talk about, but I'd also open, like to open the floor to anyone who wants to put their hand up and, uh, and maybe discuss uh, some of this. So what do we have here? Getting the right glasses on. We're mainly at the comments. There's a lot of comments, um, but one a question Anton people had is they, mm. they don't quite understand why why someone would make up Russell J. Stanford. Ah, okay. <laughs> why is he on the paper <laughs> or the multiple okay. papers? Yeah. So why is Russell? Okay, let me let me tell you why Russell J. Stanford is on the paper. Let me have a look at him. Look who he's publishing with. These people have Asian names. Russell J. Stanford is a white name. This is because someone with a white name will get published more easily than someone who doesn't. It's just straight out, out systemic racism. By creating this person, you can then, some, and, and there is a business behind this. I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect there's a business behind this. It's part of paper milling, where they create identities who you can then sell to co-author so people can have international collaborations with white people in European-based societies. And that, that then provides you with... Um, uh, that then provides you with the ability to publish more easily. So that, that's my suspicion. And mm -hmm. I think the name Russell Stanford is pretty bloody good, actually, as, a, as, a, as an example of that. Um, also, I found this six months ago and write to Elsevier. They said they'd investigate. I've chased them up twice. They said they're investigating. I've asked them to retract all of these papers. And the editors said yes, but the publisher is investigating. Now, it might be they have a much larger thing underneath that, but I tend to think that six months of waiting around indicates that it's, you know, yeah. So I, I, I on purpose haven't, even though I've discussed this with the people at Retraction Watch, I haven't made this public before. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does, in a kind of like stomach turning kind of way, <laughs> where you sort of go, oh, right, that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it it makes sense to me, but I I live in a in a bubble, so if other people can think of another good reason, I'm really happy to hear it. 
Yep. I'm wondering if we can use open arts to search for authors of affiliations at our institutions and cross reference against our actual researchers. There may be other easier ways of relevant type integration. Yeah, you absolutely can. Uh, open Alex's um, uh, affiliations are thick and rich um, uh, affiliation data. Um, and it will be a really interesting thing to ask our Open Alex colleagues when they present at 12.30 today, right here. And it, she says, would be interesting to see how widespread it is, and if it is, bring it up when negotiating publisher and license fee. Yeah, so that's another good question as well, um, in that how do we um, uh, see it? Well, Okay, so we need to use your excellent corporate systems that know exactly who your staff are uh, in each university. And I'm sure we all have just very, very well maintained identity and access systems that um, know exactly who are parts of our community. I, I say that entirely, uh, entirely sarcastic. I was going to say, Anton, you sound quite sarcastic. And yes, <laughs> right, rightly so. Identity management is a nightmare. But still, I mean, it's it's probably easier at Lincoln because we tend to actually know who everyone is. And that's a bigger institution that's harder. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and also, I mean, it was really interesting because um, we had to check against stu all student records forever, just in case he'd been a student at some point. Yes. Uh, not just current um, star, not just, and also was this a mistake with an, was this just a, a, a an error where he'd been misidentified and was there a Russell Joe Stanford somewhere that worked for Can Canterbury Kent, that, that's mm -hmm. the classic. Um, so yes, I had to go through the process of checking that as well. This is not straightforward. And, and, and insisting on using uh, uh, ORCID IDs, I think is, it for this particular evidence of um, of that. But then why would Elsevier build that into their systems and spend the, I don't know, half million pounds to, to integrate ORCID into every system they've got? Well, they don't have to. Another question, Anton, does Hope have a position yet on use of AI and editorial? I'm not even going to start talking about AI. Um, because um, it, um, it, it, it it's a whole nother thing. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's a really good question and it would be really good uh, if I thought of having a session on it. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, yeah. And I think that question kind of piggybacked off an earlier comment of, you know, oh, okay. I can't believe the editors will accept a Gmail without any proof of institutional verification. Are these papers being edited by, by AI? Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, they, they might be. They might be, and and that AI picture I put up of Russell initially, when I first generated it a few months ago, I really liked that, and now I look at it and I can tell it's AI. The eyes, the eyes aren't right. Mm, cold, dead eyes of an engineer. I mean, um, <laughs> <laughs> that hurts, Anton. That hurts. <laughs> can we see the picture again? I need to see him again now. Okay. I was thinking while you were flicking back, Anton. I was thinking about you were talking about oh, the yeah. issue. Yeah, mm -hmm. see, look, look at the eyes. The eyes. <laughs> um, Anton, I was thinking about um, in the incertification and how of of scholarly publishing, and but mm. also I liked how you drew a connection about it's sort of like the social mediafication of scholarly publishing as well with MDPI, and that made me think about how. All of our systems are engineered for this. It's not just scholarly publishing systems. It's how we are appraising and evaluating research because mm. it is about your PBRF score, which somebody noted in the comments, that people are motivated to do this, not just by the scholarly publication system, but by the reward system set up by universities and research structures. So it seems to me that it's a very broad problem with a lot of tentacles to resolve like it's not just going to be resolved by for example librarians and the questions that we can ask when we're subscribing or paying us paying our lease agreement fees yeah I, I i tend to agree but i also want to um i want us to be critical mm. in 
way that we look at things like um, our prepaid agreements, mm. publish agreements, uh, to say, okay, so we're paying you a lot of money for this. What are, what are we actually getting? But what what what's it, what can you actually provide for us that is um, better than us just putting this in an institutional repository and doing some good search engine optimization? Um, it would be interesting if, if our prisoners had no action, they should be dogged into the new security commission for widespread fraud, fraud which might breach their corporate reporting rules. I, I, is that true? Then uh, I thought they were in the Netherlands. But um, no, yeah, that's a really interesting. That's a really interesting point. I don't want to bash on Elsevier, mm -hmm. other than you know it's traditional, and um, that they're not the only people doing this. The top, all, all the top publishers, are trying to provide a good return for their shareholders and reduce costs. And um, Ever since, um, um, what's his name? Maxwell, Robert Maxwell, um, realized that this was a really good wicket to have, a really good business model to have. Um, it, it's just been a slow race to the bottom. Um, and also the fact that gold open access and open access, as we pivot, away from journals with editors of who are our colleagues to journals that are just there to produce likes and subscribes yeah um how what does that mean for um for people's misbehavior and for the and and for the service that we we get for that money Names critiquing the photo. Cool. And, um, the interesting and then, comment from M. Johnson saying, I've spent literal years trying to get action on a hijacked cert journal associating themselves with Swinburne. Um, and then in the end, I had to leave it with our research ethics committee and tell them it's a reputational risk, which they saw immediately have legal on it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and I, I think that the risk based if we, uh, again, my perception on having an, all of our actions be based on risk matrices is problematic. No, that's why. That's why I resisted it for a while because I knew exactly where mm. it was going to go after that. Mm. And the thing is, transparency in research is an important thing, and it should be celebrated, right? So we should be publicising and pointing at when people do retract and when people do issue an erratum and when people do all of that, that that's part of the process. But mm. it's so easy to be seen by someone who's not a researcher and misinterpret that. So it, it's, it, it was a really hard process, this one, and it's mm. because there are rogue operators out there, but arguably some of our top earning academic publishing outfits I would consider as rogue already. They're they're in acting against the interests of public, you know, knowledge and public access to information. So yeah. But 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 again to they're doing the right thing for the shareholders. Oh yeah. That's that's all that matters. <laughs> yeah. And, and 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 we need to we need to appreciate that. Um, yeah, we can't be naive. We can't we have to make our arguments in a way that doesn't come off as, you know, ranting, socialist, pinko, lefto, you know, all of that stuff, librarians. Yeah. But I'm tired of, of, of being careful around that one because with a well-constructed argument and with evidence and with relentless and energetic kind of lobbying, we can actually bring this to light. It's being, it's being brought to light by other sectors, not just the libraries. Um, we have to hold, maintain hope that, you know, one of these arguments will bite one of these days with with uh, the higher ups. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and, and, and the, the things that I'm pointing out are two things. One is 
one rogue guy, I think he lives in Azerbaijan, who sells false researcher identities. That's a one-off bad behavior. And, and, there, and there are technological ways through that. Um, there aren't often, but there are technological ways through that. But I also wanted to point out that questionable publishing, which is what, when we mention MDPI, is something that always comes up, or Frontiers, or any of the new model publishers, needs to be compared with what the established players are doing. And then to realize that actually they're all playing in a similar, it, 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 I'd love to see some more corporate data um, on um, uh, returns uh, on investment in terms of um, systems and, and employees for the different um, for the different organizations. I think that would be really, really uh, telling. Um, and also when we're buying services from them, like, and I don't like reading publishers of phrase. I much prefer uh, prepaid so mm -hmm. that people understand that it's paid. Um, so as we pivot to, uh, as we pivot to those kinds of things, it's just, it's just a big deal all over again. Yeah. Um, any other questions or, or thoughts? Um, there's one urban climate where Russell has published it, which has had a jump in the CEO over the past four years. Could it be a hijacked journal? Could that, it be a hijacked journal? That's a good question, Max. I don't know. You know that the the um, Retraction Watch run a hijacked journal database? I've, I've, we've been in there. What was that? We had a journal hijacked, so ah. we're aware of it. But one of the things that I've noticed is they sort of take over a title and then just pump the papers into it. And somehow Scopus can still harvesting so i think they need to look at yeah. how they do their harvesting and whether people can just say hey we've got a new url it's over there i, I did I write just... to the editors for all of the journals that russell's in to ask them you know um what they thought all of them were horrified mm. of course they were you know um but they don't manage the systems that handle where the articles go or the administration or they that's what they, that's what we're paying for is is for that server um yeah no it's a, it's a good point max and and um and again hi, retracted and hijacked journals and retracted articles the database for that is run by two guys who are journalists who just run it because it needed to be done. It, it's not a huge, it's, it's not like the Library of Congress or someone, um, you know, enormously um, um, prestigious is doing it. No journals are doing it. Um, that database, which is now, and the, the, the results of which are now going into Crossref and then from Crossref into, um, into Open Alex. Uh, is just run by the Retraction Watch uh, people. Um, and it's, so it, it, uh, it's all just um, held together with strings and bubble gum. Mm -hmm. I have to wonder whether Retraction Watch reached out to publishing organisations and said, will you fund us, you know, as in, they should make ethical, um, ethical publishing publishers should want to associate themselves with that kind yeah. of service. So I know there's compli complexities and stuff, but still, yeah. you know. I, I don't think Jenny is here, but um, I know the Committee on Publication Ethics would be a very good place for this to be held. Um, it, there are other places, but again, th these places are, we, we think, we look at their websites and we think of them as being, um, uh, you know, important, prestigious things, and it's just a bunch of people who get to meet on Zoom occasionally. It does yeah. look like 
retraction watch are getting um, support or they've been acquired by Crossref. So they've got some um, non yeah. not for profit sort of support. Yeah, That'd be right. Yeah, Cro Crossref um, understood that having metadata about retracted articles was useful. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that now flows into all of the major bibliographical managers, you know, EndNote and Zotero and um, and those places as well. But I'd, I'd heartily recommend you have a look at PubPeer and install the plugin uh, just to see. Um, it's just entertaining, uh, it, uh, if nothing else. Um, and um, it was interesting how, and I would love, to, unfortunately, the entire thing is anonymous. So I wasn't able to write to the person who pointed out that they'd found that Russell didn't. But they're a hyper commenter. And I'm assuming that it's someone like Elspeth Dick or someone like that, uh, who are one of these um, people who are doing programmatic um, um, searches through um, academic publishing to find anomalies. Okay, so we've got Deborah saying I feel better about it being funded by Crossref than by publishers who have a financial conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. um, yes, to say by publishers it's part of the justifying themselves by Crossref is independent. Well, the links, and then we had a journal hijacked and it appeared on the website. This is the catalog of hijacked titles which keeps growing. They also publish a list of all the papers they publish. Yeah. Maybe a new Ukraine journal of data fraud could be an emerging research field. Academics have researched the extent of the fraud incident to make it more widely known. I, 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 there, there kind of is. That is retraction watch. Mm -hmm. And it, it's more journalistic than it is academic. But I heartily recommend to um, spend your time reading that rather than the scholarly kitchen. The suggestion that Cosworth could offer a verified badge or something similar to journal. Yeah, so verification is interesting. So we at Canterbury now verify our ORCID ID employment details. So if you go to a Canterbury academic, we've asked them to allow us to write an employment record to their ORCID record. Um, I think that is both a very good thing in that um, you know who you're talking to, but unfortunately, it does mean that our less well-resourced um, um, colleagues in, I don't know, Francophone Africa or um, in South America, I remember when Jeffrey Beale said all Silio was, was, was predatory publishing, and it wrote off an entire continent. Um, whether they can keep up with that, and that worry that concerns me because then they just exacerbate privilege. So it would be useful, but we need to understand that that it's not necessarily. Um, I mean, the fact that to get into a Scopus journal, you have all your abstracts have to be in English, and so that means Francophone Africa is not there. Uh, a retraction score. Maybe. A retraction score. So, um, it, um, Max, do you want to talk about repeater? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> so a... I guess I guess um, I don't I don't uh, work with the repeater, so I don't know a lot about it. But I guess it's this whole idea of creating integrity markers in papers so uh, digital science has a product that looks at papers and looks for markers of integrity so things like ethics num ethics approval numbers uh, acknowledgements of funders etc so I think there are about six um, of these markers and based on that you can get a you know a score so you can go into uh, the the product and and have a look at different um articles or journals and and sort of get a feel for how trustworthy they might be um 
Mm. It's about as much. Thanks for putting me on the spot, Anton. It's about as much as I can give you. I'm not doing a good job. No, no, no. And, and thank you for bringing that because I, I think it's an interesting product and in that it looks at things like data availability statements and then follows the link on the data availability statement to make sure the data is actually there. Mm. You know more about it than I do, Anton. Yeah. <laughs> I got very excited about it. I, I, it yeah, I it's great. The... It's great. It's a great product. Um, and I think it feeds into dimensions. So you can do a lot of analysis and comparison and, and um, sort of look at authors, other authors. So if you're looking at um, collaborating with a particular author, you can get a, a feel for, you know, uh, are they, do they have a, are they, more trustworthy than my other colleagues or less trustworthy based on their, but only based on their data that they're putting out there, their, their journals, not their data, but obviously putting out their data there is a big thing as well. So, yeah, sorry, that that's uh, one of my other colleagues would be best place to talk about that, not me, sorry. Thanks, sorry Friday morning, me. Friday morning, <laughs> slow start. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you very much, people. Um, uh, I, um, I'm going to wind it up, but I'm very, very happy to discuss this with any of you um, to walk you through uh, where we're at, the, the way I got any of the figures I've got, and um, and also how we're ha handling Russell, um, who is now our mascot in our e-research team. Um, maybe one day they'll even attract his papers. Who knows? I mean, someone said, can you put the name of it in chat? I think it's I think that's the name of the retraction uh watch um tool. Sorry, the retraction uh, tool uh repeater. repeater. Yeah, repeater. Max, if you could do that for me, I'd, I'd appreciate that. So I just wanted to say thank you, Anton, for that really thought-provoking and engaging talk. Thank you everyone for coming to this session. Um, we'll wrap up now and just remind you that our next session is at 12.30 um, and is on Open Alex. All right. Thank you, everybody. Ka kite, ciao, ciao. Ka kite. Ciao, da. Ka kite. Ka kite, ciao, ciao as well. <laughs> <laughs>